Cumberland Mountain stands tall above Cumberland Gap. It's an impregnable wall. It comes down all the way down the Appalachian chain out of Virginia. It was discovered by Thomas Walker, trailblazed through by Daniel Boone, and thousands upon thousands of people come through here sailing Kentucky. And as the Civil War come to a start, they want to protect this gap on one side or the other, so they place guns here on top of this mountain. And one of these special guns is called Long Tom. Now you can see this gap from a long ways off, from the north or the south end, whichever way you're looking. It's just a gap in the mountain, you can see it. And they want to protect this pass, keep one side or the other from coming through it. Now here's an old topo map of the gun emplacement for Big Tom overlooking the gap. And it had a devastating range of five miles. Now here's an old map that shows the different, I guess the different occupations from the time. This is the close of 63. And you can see this old map here Cumberland Gap's right in the middle of the wall between the north and the south. And it was a gateway to either way. And nobody was ever foolish enough to take this or assault this gap militarily. This is a picture of Cumberland Gap in 1862. I think it's when the Union had it, not when the Confederacy had it. And you can see it's just a pass in this mountain that when the guns are in the right place, it would be a devastating to attack it. Now here they had the standard issue 12 pounders all around the ridges, mountains, ridges, protect this pass. But they wanted a special gun. The Confederates had tried to get a bigger gun just to protect this pass from the longer range. And they acquired one from a coastal place somewhere in the southeast, and they brought it up. Now this, this gun here is a coastal gun, but I think it's way too big to drag up that mountain. Now most likely, it was a gun something like this. Now we know the gun's 18 foot long, but it might be this style. Nobody knows for sure. There's no really records on it of what it is. But we do know that it was a, probably a 32 pound smooth bullet bored out and rifled to a 64 pounder. Probably looks something like this, this style of can. But no one knows for sure. That's lost in history. Now this is just a picture of how they probably got it up on the gap. Probably had no carriage for that, so they laid it on a wagon or whatever and they drug it up that mountain. And I say they had a hard time. Now here, they would set it in place on their gun emplacement, whatever setup they had for it. And I say that was a hard time. Now this old gun is either a Napoleon style gun an ordnance rifle style or a parrot rifle style. We still don't know the definition of that one, of what it really was. We do know about Long Tom. It's 18 feet long. It had a bore to accept a 64 pound shell. The weight was unknown, probably eight to 10,000 pounds. And the range was five miles. Five miles. Now here's a modern topo map of the range of five miles from where the gun emplacement was. You can see it reached almost to the Powell River and even past the city of Minnesburg. It had a devastating range and no one, the opposing forces, never was brave enough or foolish enough to assault the defenses of Cumberland Gap.
It only took a fraction of a man to defend this against a major army this past. It was just so steep and so high off the floor of this gap. Now here, these are different size shells, but this is probably one of these styles is what old Long Tom used. We don't know if it was a round or cylinder type or explosive charge, solid shot. We just, we don't know. There's no records indicating it either. But this is the kind of shell that they used. Now you can see the field of view here that they have at the pinnacle where the gun was emplaced at. Five miles. That's a long way. So they had a good field of view here. Any opposing force would have been exposed to this fire. And five miles is probably just where the road goes over the hill. Now every time they retreated, or every time they was outflanked and they had to trade the place out with the other force, they would shove it over the mountain and they'd spike it with a hard file or some kind of object to keep it being useless to the enemy. But after they took the place back, whoever their force was, they'd drag it right back up that mountain. Probably spent days and weeks trying to drag it up there with every horse and mule they could find. And they'd set it right back in place. Now the North didn't have much ammunition for it. They had what was left or confiscated when the Confederacy left it. So they didn't have the ammunition for this. This is an oddball ammunition that they just didn't carry. Now here the old soldier, infantryman, he was probably a support unit for the artillery units that's on this ridge and on this mountain. And I know he got homesick, missing home, got bored. So they would chisel their name in this rock around the top of this mountain guess just to, just to pass the time. But besides all the confetti that was rolled out here on it, you could see where they chiseled their name in. A lot of different names all along the top of these rocks on this mountain. Some of them are so faded, you just can't read them because they're weatherworn. We're talking 170 years ago. Now here I tried to mark some what I could read. I can't read all of it, but what I can read, I, I tried the description just to help y'all out. Long time ago, a lot of history's passed through this mountain, under it, over it, around it, a lot of history. And the last time they shoved this old cannon over the hill, it was late 63 or early 64, and they never brought it back up until the end of the war, it laid there. Now, a lot of stories about this old Long Tom, what happened to it. Some say it's still laying there at the foot of the pinnacle. Some say they drug it out and took it down to the gap and hitched their horses to it for years. Some say then they they took it to Chattanooga on a riverboat or by a wagon or something to Chattanooga and melted it down. Gone forever. Some say they got it, drug it out, took it out on a flat belt, a flatbed in the middle of the night to who knows where. Some say they took it to the Iron Furnace, but no, Iron Furnace couldn't accept nothing that big. They took iron ore, probably from rocks and stuff that was mined in the area, or ingots or whatever. It was just way too big to be melted down in the Iron Furnace of the Gap. So, some say it's still laying out the foot of the mountain, buried under rocks and dirt or debris. But either way, I hope you like this bit of history, and 
help you out enjoyed it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.